First one patient, then the next, then the next, then the next. It goes all the way to 22, and I believe more. Did they not notice all the patients dropping dead? Well, probably not. I mean, it was a hospital, but it all seems wrong. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. Let's just start at the beginning. Take a listen to this. On August 31st, a staff member finds a 73-year-old male patient convulsing in his bed. He has no history of seizures. According to his medical chart, he was given medication 10 minutes before the seizures began. The Post-Gazette reports the man is rushed to Butler Hospital, where doctors discover the seizures have been brought on by hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a condition in which the body's blood sugar level is lower than the standard range. This is a condition almost always related to diabetes. The patient is not diabetic. Treating doctors believe the only way this patient's blood sugar could have plummeted is if someone had given him a massive dose of insulin. The attending physician is able to get the man stabilized, and he recovers. Okay, I'm a JD, not an MD, so I'm going to need someone to interpret what I just heard. Uh, joining me, before I go to investigative reporter for the New York Post, Deirdre Bardoff, I, I just got to go to a doc, mm -hmm. or in our case, we also have a forensic nurse expert. Dr. Kendall Crowns is joining me, Chief Medical Examiner, Tarrant County, that's Fort Worth, Lecturer, University of Texas, Austin, and Texas Christian University Medical School. And Dr. Kendall Crowns, what did that reporter just say? I always think of diabetics or, or blood sugar as uh, the problem would be high blood sugar. I thought low blood sugar is a good thing. So low blood sugar is a good thing, but critically low blood sugar where you aren't getting any sugar in your body, your brain thrives on sugar. If your blood sugar goes too low, it causes your brain to short out and you have seizures and it goes to coma and you eventually die. Also joining us in, ad in addition to Dr. Kendall Crowns, Valerie Creel. She has so many letters beside her name. Um, no vowels, RN, BSN, CCRN, forensic nurse expert with the Godoy Medical Forensics, board certified in critical care nursing, and you can find her at godoymedical.net. Valerie Creel, agree or disagree with what Dr. Kendall Crowns just said? I agree, and I would also like to add that blood sugar, like most labs within the within the body are found within a normal range. So anything outside of that normal range would need to be treated once it reaches an extreme value. For example, if a blood sugar reaches lower than 70, a lot of patients would present with symptoms such as shakiness, sweating, symptoms that you get if you would go for a long time without eating. That would also be considered mild hypoglycemia. But once you reach more severe levels, it would need to be reversed with medication, such as dextrose. Well, the other thing is, and I'm going to go to special guest joining us, investigative reporter, New York Post, Deirdre Bardoff. Deirdre, uh, when you're in the hospital, you assume that you're surrounded by doctors and nurses, and they're not going to let your blood sugar get so low that you die. Right, right. Yeah, of course. Um, so is this the first alone. patient, mm -hmm. Deirdre, that dies, a 73-year-old male patient convulsing? Is it the first person mm -hmm. that's the first patient to die? Yeah, I believe so, among many, ranging all different ages. In addition to Deirdre Bardoff, Valerie Krill, and Dr. Kendall Crowns, High-profile lawyer joining me in this jurisdiction, Rob N. Pierce, managing partner, Robert Pierce & Associates. You can find him at piercelaw.com. Rob, thank you for being with us. Where is this particular facility located where the first death occurred? Butler County is approximately 20 miles outside of Pittsburgh. Well, six weeks later, Another dead body. Listen. 
About six weeks later, another quality of life patient ends up in the hospital. He's being treated for a urinary tract infection, but while he's there, nurses discover the 55-year-old patient is also hypoglycemic. The Post-Gazette reports the man has never been diagnosed with diabetes, and once his blood sugar is stabilized, he returns to the quality of life services facility. It's not over yet. Listen. About four weeks after the 55-year-old patient returns to Quality of Life Services, he is back at the Butler Memorial Hospital. Again, his blood sugar is so abnormally low that medical staff is suspicious. WTAE reports investigators say the man's pre-existing medical conditions would prevent him from administering the insulin himself. It would have had to be done by someone else. Three hours later, his 83-year-old sweet mate at Quality of Life Services is admitted with the exact same symptoms, hypoglycemia. While this patient is diabetic, he is in the end stages of dementia and hospice care. There's no way he could have injected himself with insulin. And then quite the coincidence. Take a listen to our friends at Crime Online. Medical providers at Butler Memorial Hospital are unable to stabilize the 55-year-old patient during his second visit, and he dies after his family ends life-sustaining care. Three weeks later, on Christmas Day, his sweet mate at Quality of Life Services also dies. The New York Post reports the Butler Memorial staff is shocked and saddened. Since neither man had been capable of injecting themselves with insulin, staff begins to consider that someone is deliberately hurting patients. Okay, Lisa Daddio joining me, former police lieutenant with New Haven PD, also the lead detective on the Annie Lay case, which was a real puzzle, director of the Center of Advanced Policing and grad program coordinator. Lisa Daddio, thank you for being with us. Listen, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, but I know this. When you have multiple patients keeling over that are not diabetic of hypoglycemia, including two roommates, I would immediately start a homicide investigation. Absolutely, Nancy. Um, What I don't understand, and, and here's where it gets a little complicated. Obviously, the facility where these deaths happened would have to have contacted the police department or a family member if they were concerned, but... I'm guessing they didn't know the manner or the cause of death at the time that this happened, but the facility definitely knew. Um, So they would have had an obligation to contact authorities. We've gone into facilities like this in the past with a lot less than what happened in this particular case. Guys, we are talking about a facility, a healthcare facility, including a hospital, where people just die one after the next. And of course, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, is not contagious. So why are they all dying? And back to Dr. Kendall Crowns, when your sugar goes low, why do you die? And I'm confused about how if you inject insulin into your body, that would make your sugar lower. Explain that. Basically, what happens is insulin uh, is produced by your pancreas naturally to help you process blood sugar. And when uh, uh, you are injected with a lot of insulin, it causes your blood sugar to be improperly ingested or decreased or lowered artificially to a critical level. So if you're given a huge amount of insulin all at once, it critically drops your blood sugar, and then your brain no longer has the fuel that it uses to function, and your brain shuts down, you go into a coma, and then you eventually die. Back to Rob Ian Pierce joining us, managing partner Robert Pierce and Associates. And Associates. Rob, again, you, you told me that this is generally near Pittsburgh, but what kind of a facility is this? Is it a hospital? Is it a, it can't be an old folks home because one guy was just 55 years old. What is it? You have a series of uh, healthcare and rehabilitation facilities that generally speaking care for those patients for a variety of medical needs that often are very serious in nature. So the age of the residents oftentimes are older, but that being said, there are younger people there. Well, is it a uh, hospital? What, what is it? It, it is a, a, a long-term healthcare facility. Long-term 
health care facility like a, a rehab or, or, or what? Like the, the next step when you get out of the hospital, but you're not quite ready to go home? It, it depends what uh, each one of these facilities offer different services, but generally speaking, it's long term health care. Uh, some of them do offer hospice services, but again, each one of these facilities uh, is different and unique in nature. Uh, back to Deirdre Bardoff joining us with the New York Post. So, is it a rehab? Is it a hospital? Well, what is it? Quality Life Services is a retirement nursing facility in Chakora, which is in Butler County. Is it a chain? It is a chain. Okay. To Elisa Daddio, what's the first thing you would do as, well, right now we've got three dead bodies, but that's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I mean, we should have been contacted, obviously, after the first death when suspicion was raised. Um, we would request information, and, and they're going to claim that we're not privy to it necessarily, so it's going to require search they? and seizure warrants. Who is going to claim who is not privy to the information? The, the facility uh, underneath HIPAA. And, and so they're not going to be willing to give us records on all the patients that have died in their care over a prolonged period of time. Um, so we need to start with, you know, the commonalities, how many patients have died and under what circumstances. And oftentimes when dealing with the medical facility, they're not willing to give you that information without having a court order. And then we turn to scuttlebutt. In other words, who's saying what down at the nurse's station? That is correct. And I want to hear everything that's said amongst the nurses, amongst the doctors, amongst the orderlies, against every person that cleaned a bedpan. What do these patients have in common? Dr. Jory L. Crossan joining us, psychology psychologist, former law enforcement, now faculty at St. Leo University and author of Operation SOS. Dr. Jory, I, I recall when my dad went for his first open heart surgery and he was airlifted to University of Alabama. We took him to world-renowned Emory University, and he was in such bad shape, they wouldn't take him. So he was airlifted to Alabama. They saved his life, by the way. But about three days into his stay there, one after the next after the next person started dying on his, his hall. But it was from a deadly staph infection. That's understandable, not good, but understandable. Here, you have people that had never been diabetic suddenly dying of hypoglycemia, and it wasn't a simple death. They didn't just like fall asleep and die. They would convulse and, and then die, including two sweet mates. Yeah, I see that there's, there's a pattern definitely with the, the methodology but there's also a pattern in the behavior, and that's got to revert back to certain individuals that have access to that type of medication to practice that methodology of death. Uh, another thing, uh, and this is to Lisa Daddio or whoever wants to jump in, you start listening to what the nurses, the orderlies, everyone, the cleaners are saying, and someone comes forward. Take a listen to our cut right. nine. During the investigation, a nurse who works with Presty says Presty commented that one of her patients would be better off dead right before he is hospitalized with hypoglycemia. In court filings, medical records clearly show it was Nurse Presty who is in charge of the medication chart. Okay, Rob Ian Pierce joining us, managing partner Robert Pierce and Associates, as well as Deirdre Bardolph with the New York Post. Who is this woman, Deirdre? Who is Heather Presty? Mm -hmm. Right, Heather Presty is a nurse um, who only joined uh, the, the practice uh, a few years ago, um, working for several different healthcare facilities uh, in, her, in her brief career. Uh, she started in uh, veterinary school, um, was a vet tech, uh, and then uh, became a, a nurse. And um, she worked at these different facilities and um, 
jumped around and uh, had a history of different uh, disciplinary uh, actions against her uh, in her in her time. What kind of disciplinary actions? You know, the, the documents that I've gone through don't specify uh, too much about her her accusations, um, but. I think there are some mentions of uh, mistreatment of patients. You know, it's always curious to me why when someone has disciplinary actions against them, they continue to be hired. They just go to a different facility. We know a little bit about it. Take a listen to our cut two. Heather Presti is the Assistant Director of Nursing at Quality of Life Services in Western Pennsylvania. Quality of Life Services is a skilled nursing facility with several locations offering services from short-term rehabilitation to hospice care. Presty began working at Quality of Life Services as a registered nurse, and during her six months with the group, she's promoted to assistant director of nursing and later the interim director of nursing. So she's just not a nurse. She is the director of nursing at this facility. Wow. Wow. For someone with a history of disciplinary actions against her, how the hey did she make it to director of nursing? Uh, Valerie Creel, RN, you ever seen anything like it? You know, it's not uncommon, especially in skilled nursing facilities, because the way that these types of facilities are structured is that there are a handful of RNs that oversee a licensed vocational nurses and nursing assistants. So. Typically, the RNs will be in charge of medications and supervision of these other staff members. The registered nurses would then step in if there was a call-off, for example, of an LVN, but generally they were not involved in direct care. But due to the nursing shortage um, or related to COVID and the number of facilities that were available, they may have just been short-staffed and they weren't necessarily looking for the best of the best nurse. They were just trying to get these patients cared for because these patients have, there's such a high number of these patients in these facilities. Right. So that probably played into it. What more do we know? Take a listen to our cut seven. Investigators and staff members turned to Heather Presti. Her positions at Quality of Life Services, first as assistant director and later as the interim director of nursing, puts her in authority to investigate possible abuses taking place. Then an RN comes forward by passing Presti to make sure what she has to say is heard. So what does that mean? To Rob Pierce, Managing Director, Robert Pierce & Associates, Rob is representing 10 families connected to this case. Uh, I want you to hear, Rob, what our friends at Crime Online have to say in our Cut 8. A registered nurse at the facility says she was to relieve Presty on August 31st. That's the day the 73-year-old ended up at Butler Hospital the first time, but 30 minutes after her shift ends, Presty still hasn't left. According to ABC News, the RN reports she saw Presty walk in the direction of the 73-year-old patient's room. It isn't long after the man has the medical emergency. The RN says she sees a box of Lancets sitting on a table in his room. Nurses use Lancets to check blood sugar. But this patient doesn't have diabetes. Rob Pierce joining us. Rob, how many people, how many patients do you believe can be connected to Heather Presby? We don't know an exact number as of today. Uh, what we do know is there are at least 22 patients uh, that she is admitted to either harming or killing. 17 of the 22 have passed away. Uh, I do know that we are currently investigating six others, and the Attorney General's office is also investigating those claims that have very similar conduct, very similar circumstances. And I'm afraid this may be the tip of the iceberg. Rob Pierce, explain to me, was she going from facility to facility, allegedly killing people? It's very analogous to pedophiles that go, whether it be with uh, some of the church situations or other uh, places, they're let go from one place. No one says much of anything. They go to another place and the same conduct occurs over and over and over again. Uh, 
you know, what we do know is that uh, Heather Presby was at 11 different facilities within five years before she was arrested. Dear Joe Bardolf, joining us in the New York Post, tell me about the charges that have been filed against the nurse, Heather Presby, as of right now. Yes. So as of now, um, Heather Presty has has been charged with mistreating 22 patients uh, ranging in age from 43 to 104 years old. Uh, In all, 17 of those patients uh, have died, but she has uh, not been charged in in the depths of of all of those uh, yet. So right now she's only charged, (laughs) Deirdre, with 17 of the 22? Yeah, so 17 counts of, of attempted murder. Question, Deirdre, was her MO, modus operandi, method of operation, always the same? Did every patient suffer hypoglycemia, go into convulsions and die? It seems that, yes, using insulin was, was the way that she uh, harmed these patients. Um, it was something that she kind of bragged about having a lot of experience with um, insulin that is. Now, that first incident that happened back in August, Heather Presley checked out of work, and then two hours later, the staff finds the 73-year-old victim dead. He had had seizures and suffered from severe hypoglycemia immediately after Presley provided direct care to him. So, Valerie Creel joining us, forensic nurse expert, how would we go about proving that her action killed the 77-year-old? Well, you could look at the big picture and find the pattern, but you could start with each patient, starting with their presenting symptoms and then walk back in the charting, look at how they were earlier in the evening when they were normal, and then look at the pattern of events that took place, who was in the room, what medications were administered, how they presented after the interaction with Prezi, and go from there. Um, you can look at whether or not they had a history of diabetes. Um, with the severity of hypoglycemia, it shouldn't be that much of a factor, but you can just look at the overall pattern and see, you know, was the delay of care a factor? Because if she was a registered nurse, she should have recognized mm-hmm. the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and gotten help for that patient. We also know that a 58-year-old woman who was not insulin dependent also dies. She was admitted for low blood sugar sugar after being found unresponsive, but then she dies after being in the care of Heather Presby. Rob Pierce, do all of these 22 victims that we know of, were they all suffering from hypoglycemia or are there other methods of operations? There are other methods. Uh, not every patient uh, and resident that was harmed was diabetic. Many were not. And so they would be provided insulin that was obviously either not prescribed or in a dosage that was well in excess of what was prescribed uh, that eventually led to their passing away. In fact, at, in one case, a woman dies after getting 60 units of insulin. What is that, Dr. Kendall Crowns? What are 60 units of insulin? 60 units of insulin is, a, is probably six times the normal dose. Uh, it's not something that you should ever see in an individual, especially when they're not being given insulin, uh, ever being given to them. So that's a lethal dose no matter how you slice it. We are talking about these victims as if they were beyond help. One of these women, were she was just 55 years old. Uh, One victim, 58. These people are young people in the prime of their lives, and I can't help but hearken back to a nurse that murdered so many of her patients, Lucy Letby. Listen. Lucy Lebby tried to kill twin boys when they were just a day old. The babies are known as Baby L and Baby M. It took nearly 30 minutes to get Baby M's heart to restart, but both babies survived. The parents were never told what caused the babies to crash, but experts concluded it was caused by air being injected into the bloodstream. 
Two years later, when police were investigating, the parents were finally told what happened to their babies. And there's more. Many of the children died. Take a listen to Cut 10. When two out of three healthy triplets die within 24 hours of each other, a team of seven consultants led by Dr. Stephen Brary talk openly about their concerns about Lucy Letby. Brary points out that nobody wants to consider a member of the staff being responsible for harming babies in their care. But two out of three triplets dying in 24 hours can't be ignored. Rob Pierce, there are many, many cases of angels of death doctors, but mostly nurses that kill their patients. And in Letby's case, she also used ODs of insulin to kill infants. So uh, Rob Pierce, in that case, it took two of three triplets to be murdered before anyone finally put a stop to it. Here we have 22 victims that we know of did they not notice? Did they not think on number 14 or 15, wow, there's something wrong. There's something nefarious going on within our center? I think it's pretty clear that the facilities did not do enough to investigate the staff complaints about Heather Presby. Oh, what were the staff complaints? There, our investigation and the attorney general's investigation has shown that early on staff was concerned about the amount of time uh, Heather Presley spent with particular patients and then their care deteriorated uh, shortly thereafter. In addition, uh, there are some allegations that staff referenced her to be the killer nurse because her patients tended to pass away. And the constant theme amongst the 11 facilities she worked in over five years was that she had extra amount of time with patients, the patients deteriorated, and then she either resigned or was terminated due to abusive behavior towards patients or staff. I mean, her, her nickname was the killer nurse. Is that what you said? Yes, there uh, are some staff members that have indicated she is the, known as the killer nurse. I mean, Dr. Jory Crawson, joining me, psychologist. Dr. Jory, if I were one of the victim's family, I'd want to go burn the whole place down. They knew something was wrong. Her nickname was the killer nurse, and they did nothing. And one patient after the next after the next continues to die, and a painful death, too. We see this in, like you said, nursing professions, but there's other professions where we see this type of homicidal behavior, and they go on to continue on in that profession. One thing I wanted to comment on her background was when she was the veterinarian tech, she practiced euthanasia. She was the one that put the animals down. And on one of the patients in her confession, she said, looked at me like an animal would, helpless and like she needed something. There was no quality of life. That was like directly from the affidavit. So, uh, you know, that there's going to be a connection between the practice of euthanasia that she learned as a vet tech now coming into the nursing profession. Rob Pierce, uh, I didn't realize that when she was a vet tech, she took peculiar interest in euthanizing animals. Did you know that? We are aware that... Uh, she spent many years as a vet tech, and that was part of her job. Uh, but as your other guests are indicating, uh, sometimes that's a, a beginning of a sign of concern uh, if there is enjoyment uh, with that act. I, I don't understand the enjoyment you get out of killing something, but take a listen to our cut 11. Heather Presti was previously charged with homicide, accused of intentionally overdosing her patients with insulin. Now she's facing new charges. Attorney General Michelle Henry says 41-year-old Heather Presti is charged with two new counts of first-degree murder, 17 new counts of attempted murder, and 19 counts of neglect of a care-dependent person. Presti is accused of administering excessive amounts of insulin to these patients, some of whom were diabetic and required insulin, and some of whom were not. The AG said 17 patients cared for by Presti died. It won't be just a matter of proving 
the physiology, the cause of death in these cases. There's extrinsic evidence as well. Wait till the jury hears this. Our cut 13. According to the police criminal complaint report, Presti took substantial steps to kill the patients in question intentionally. Currently, four of the deceased have confirmed causes of death. Five of the patients survived the overdoses. The victims ranged from 43 to 104 years old. Presti worked at 12 different nursing homes or long-term skilled nursing care facilities from October 2018 until her arrest in May. The alleged murders took place at seven of those care facilities. The criminal complaint includes statements from previous co-workers. According to multiple staff members, Presti allegedly openly and frequently commented that the patients just need to die. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, all of these chains, they need to be closed down. I mean, Rob Pierce, she was saying the patients, quote, need to die and nobody did anything? They just kept her there? I think what you have to try to separate is that some staff members tried to do something. We have uh, evidence that they complained to management and that management either did very little or did a quick investigation and continued to allow Heather Presby to serve as either the assistant director or director of nursing. What do you mean so by there a are quick people investigation? That tried to stop it, but unsuccessfully. What do you mean by a quick investigation? What exactly happened? We are aware uh, in the case of Marion Bauer that there were staff members at uh, Bel Air Healthcare and Rehabilitation Center complained about the amount of time Heather Presby was spending with certain patients and that some of those patients either got very sick or passed away. Uh, we are, have been informed that uh, they notified someone in management. We also know uh, that coincidentally, the state came in and issued a citation of immediate jeopardy, which is where uh, there's a citation that patients either have been harmed or are likely to be harmed based upon conduct within a facility. Heather Presti was given a brief removal from her management position while investigation occurred. Uh, our information revealed that they did not feel there was sufficient charges to dismiss her at that time and put her back in for the care of patients. Mm. Unfortunately, thereafter, more patients passed away, not just at Bel Air, but at several other subsequent facilities. What more did Heather Presdy say, just 41 years old? Take a listen to our friends at Crime Online and cut 17. According to investigators, Heather Presti said things to others about patients like one woman looked at her like an animal would. She told investigators one man had no quality of life, saying she felt bad for another and one just needed to die. At Sunnyview Nursing and Rehabilitation in Butler, co-workers told investigators that Presti often said residents just needed to die. But Presti's attorney said her actions were motivated by mercy, the actions of a caregiver who wanted to spare patients she saw as far too infirm. Presby is not the first angel of death. Does the name Charles Cullen ring a bell? Take a listen to 20. Charles Cullen worked as a nurse for 16 years, spanning multiple New Jersey medical centers, but wherever Cullen worked, patients seemed to die mysteriously. Before a thorough investigation could be done, Cullen would leave, lie on a job application, and get another nursing job at another medical center. Investigators finally caught up with Cullen and say he killed at least 29 people. He claims to be responsible for as many as 40 murders committed as an active nurse where he used insulin and other injectables to kill his patients. And, of course, there's Jonathan Hayes. With no discussion will be complete without him. Listen. In North Carolina, prosecutors claim a rogue male nurse is to blame for the alleged jabbing of two patients with lethal doses of insulin at a hospital. WFMY reports 47-year-old Jonathan Hayes is now a former nurse at Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem. Hayes is charged with two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. Hayes is accused of administering a near-lethal dose of insulin to Pamela Little, who survived the December 1st, 2021 jab. A month later, on January 5th, 2022, he allegedly administered a lethal dose to Gwen Crawford and 17 days later gave a third patient, Vicki Lingerfeld, a lethal dose. Authorities say both women died on January 27th. A Pennsylvania nurse, Heather Presby, accused of murdering patients with fatal doses of insulin, is now confessing 
and her lawyer claims, but it was a mercy motivation. Like, you think I care her motivation for murder? It's still murder. She talks about her patients like they're animals. Rob Pierce, what's the latest? The attorney general's office is continuing to investigate any other uh, allegations uh, from similar patients. Uh, there are uh, criminal charges that are pending and that uh, in uh, February of next year, uh, there is some discussion of potentially having a preliminary hearing where her criminal lawyers and the attorney general's representatives uh, can discuss if a plea agreement is appropriate or not based a on the plea facts shown agreement. At the time. Is this not a death penalty case? I would defer to the attorney general's office uh, as to. Well, has anybody announced we're going to seek the death penalty? Uh, I have not heard anything that they're seeking the death penalty. Good gravy! How many people do you have to kill in that jurisdiction of Pennsylvania? before they at least try to get the, te the death penalty. This nurse claiming she killed patients because she pitied their, quote, quality of life while their families were paying an arm and a leg to have their loved ones taken care of. And then comes along Heather Presdy. I don't know that I would call her an angel of death. She's more like the devil's minion of death. We wait. As justice unfolds. And just in case you're listening, Pennsylvania AG, we've got nearly 20 dead bodies that we know of. And you don't have the backbone to seek the death penalty? I'm not saying if you get it, can't you at least try for Pete's sake? We wait as justice unfolds. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.